Ladies and gentlemen, the Q&A session is about to start. If you would like to ask a question, please use the chat functionality in the live stream. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now move to the last section of our Investors Day, the question and answer session. And with me on stage are Karsten, our group CFO, Matthias, our Chief Investment Officer, and Pia, who will lead us through the Q&A session. A very warm welcome to our financial analysts who will be joining us via video call, and a thank you to our financial analysts. Not because we always share the same opinions, but because you are actually the very first ones, often early in the morning, to analyze our numbers and our key messages. Thank you for, pro for providing us clear feedback, and thank you for being the wider bridge to the capital market. I would say welcome, although it's a bit virtual, of course, but very warm welcome to all of you. And very warm welcome also, for the first time I can say that, to the over 1,000 people who have been watching and following us through, throughout this, this afternoon, actually, uh, the Investors' Day. But without any further delay, I think we should start trying to answer the questions. We're look, looking forward to it. So, Pia, over to you. Thank you, Gert. So, regarding the procedure, we will start with the questions from the analysts in the call, and then we would turn to the questions that came in via the chat function. So, for all of you who are watching the live stream, if you have a question, please type it in in the section underneath the live stream, and we will then follow up after questions from the call. Let's dig right into it. First question comes from Peter Elliott, Keplo Chevreux. Peter, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentations. Uh, I feel a little bit ashamed. My numbers are, are mostly numbers driven on the targets, but uh, I guess we are analysts. Um, the first one was uh, you talked about 1 billion value creation um, from the innovations by 2025. I was just wondering if you could give any insight into how you got to that figure and, and what the main drivers are. I and mean, is it because you've got high confidence on a few large initiatives like Friday, or, or is it more about sort of playing the number of the game, given the number you know, that you've got uh, ongoing? Um, secondly, um, I was just wondering if you can give any more detail on the cost reduction target. Um, I guess all of the countries talked about it, so it's sort of clearly a wide-ranging initiative along, along the group, but I'm just wondering if there's any levers in particular that you wanted to highlight. Um, and then finally, um, just on the new cash uh, ratio uh, target, um, sorry, payout ratio target of 60 to 80, um, which I think applies immediately, but I, I guess you know, you've been at sort of 63% uh, or thereabouts for the last three years, so towards the lower end of the range, but still within the range. So I guess my question is, you know, has the philosophy now change? Um, and is there a desire to sort of move up the range or target the middle of the range? Or um, I don't know if you can shed any light on that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, I, I hope I remember the three questions. I will try to actually answer the, the, the first two ones and then hand over to Karsten for uh, the question on uh, cash. In terms of innovation, as uh, Karsten has said before, we will be actually investing 10 to 30 percent of uh, what, uh, what we generate operationally as cash into innovation in the core and beyond the core. Of course, over the last couple of years, we have already been doing that, huh? so it's not new. We have uh, built up a very diversified, very full innovation funnel and pipeline focusing on mobility and home. That means that it's actually spread over these two ecosystems. There are a few uh, bigger initiatives, you know them, Friday, you mentioned it, Peter, but also Movu, our uh, digital relocation platform in Switzerland, and Mobly, our mobility services platform in Belgium. But actually, as we go along, we will, of course, extend that innovation funnel, so it will be a broad range of innovation. You've heard from a lot of colleagues in the diversifying the core part this afternoon what this will be. And of course, we're not starting from zero. The one billion that we talk about by 2025, uh, if you look back at the media for equity um, transaction we did with Friday two years ago, we already valued Friday at that point in time, or our partners valued Friday at that point in time over 200 million. So we're not starting from scratch. 
On the second question, the cost uh, ambition, so a cost ambition of 200 million Swiss francs, actually, you can, you can take them down, I would say, in two big parts in terms of how will we achieve that. The first one is we will work smarter together. So we are a relatively uh, small European group and with four countries, and actually we can combine much more forces in doing things together. So an example might be a solvency hub, a solvency compet competence center in one location. So smarter together is the first element of this cost reduction initiative and actually of the cost ambition. The second one is radical simplification. I give you one example. Um, we have over 500 life and non-life products in our group. We have analyzed this and we will actually shut down over the next year one third of it. You can imagine what kind of complexity reduction and cost, cost reduction this might entail in terms of processes, in terms of know-how of people, IT systems and so forth. So smarter together working and radical simplification, for example, in the product and services range we are offering. On the third question, Carsten, up to you. Yeah, th thank you very much, um, Peter, for your question. Um, we remain committed um, to our attractive and reliable payout policy uh, up only um, as we have done in the past. So the basic philosophy um, has not changed. What we are doing, though, is in the next tr strategic phase, linking it closer to cash remittance. And this is where the 60 to 80 percent cash payout ratio um, comes from. But the basic philosophy of up-only dividend policy remains unchanged. Did that answer your three questions, Peter? Thank you very much. The next question is from Farouk Hanif from Credit Suisse. Farouk, your question, please. Hi, sorry about my son in the background there. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I just want to first uh, touch upon the network effect from the ecosystems. So what evidence can you give us that, let's say, for example, a Movu customer is buying insurance or an insurance customer is going to use Batmade? What numbers can you give us on cross-sale, um, on the network effect? Um, that's question one. Secondly, on the 200 million revenues target from ecosystem, how much of that will come inorganically? So you clearly you're investing. But, you know, are you going to grow a lot of that organically or do you depend on quite a lot of deployment of capital? Um, and I guess the last um, question is on the combined profit impact of what you're telling us in terms of revenue. So if we had Friday at 150, if we had uh, of premiums, if we had, um, you know, the 200 million of uh, ecosystem revenues and we had that cost cutting, what, what are you talking about in terms of incremental profit uplift? Thanks. Thank you for the question. No need to excuse uh, for the sun. We are actually standing inside and don't have the sun here in Basel today. So um, in terms of the, the innovation, if you, if you look at it broadly, about 50% of the revenues will actually come from cross-selling and upselling our insurance and, and financial products. So that's more or less the range that we are looking for. So 50% of that revenue will be generated by the cross and upselling of our traditional financial services and insurance businesses. And of course, there are investments required uh, in order to get to the 200 million of, of revenue. Uh, however, as I said, we have already invested a lot of the in the past, will continue to do so. So we are actually gradually building on it. Um, on the earning side, Carsten, up to you. Well, let me make a reference to, um, to our Balois value management framework, framework that I was mentioning uh, earlier. And those has four pillars, earnings, capital, cash and optionality. Um, and particularly also when we talk about the ecosystems, we are talking also about uh, optionality and maybe a little less about uh, the earnings side of things. So um, the focus there is on optionality and therefore valuation of this optionality that is created within the ecosystems. Any follow-up question, or does that is is that okay with you? Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of our projections, where will we see? I guess I was trying to trying to get an angle from you on where we, you know, see this reported, where we'd see some sort of profit impact. I mean, I understand the valuation optionality today, when we can look at your, the revenues you're generating, let's say from Friday or from the other things, but. Over time, obviously, there'll be an expectation, and, and obviously, Christoph talked about it for Friday of, of profit. So, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, 
how will you be able to demonstrate that value in numbers rather than what an IPO is willing to pay? Um, thank you for the, uh, for the follow-up question. I'm, I'm happy to, to address it. Um, starting from the beginning of Simply Safe Season 2, and that means uh, from 2020, uh, 2022 onwards, uh, we will uh, report about uh, the development of this um, innovation part of the uh, next strategic stint. So uh, we will com uh, start to report on it um, from the 2022 onwards. Next question, Pia. And we have a next question from Fulin Liang, Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead with your question. Um, hi, thank you. This is a very uh, interesting series of um, sections today. I have three questions. So the first one is you mentioned about the one billion value creation. Presumably, I, I would have thought that this all kind of innovation would be done through your general account. That, that, does that mean actually you would, as a shareholder, would basically enjoy 100% of this one billion or part of them actually will be done through policyholder funds, so you have to share with them. So that's that's my first question. Um, the sec, uh, and also, well, as a follow-up, uh, and this one billion, is it simply just understand it as will kind of flow through p and uh, eventually or gradually, or how should I think about this one billion ultimately impact to your um, financial statements? So that's the first one. And the second one is you talking about um, the investment in innovation. So basically you're talking about uh, roughly 200, mi uh, 200 million to 600 million um, for your innovation. Are these all um, investments into new startups or some of them are actually just um, investments into improving your um, existing infrastructures. Um, so how, how should I think about that? That's kind of so what proportion of this is new investments actually? What proportion is actually just improving? Um, so that's the second one. And the last one is so it sounds like to me that the if your life se segment is only contributing about 200 million um, Swiss francs, you, you kind of, um, you know, sounds like to me, you kind of de-emphasize the importance of life segments um, within the group. Can you, you, if in that's the case, can you kind of justify what's the point of group own, still owning the, the, the best owner of your life business? Thank you. Let me try to answer first and then maybe hand over to Matthias and Karsten because uh, uh, it were multiple dimensions, I would say, uh, in the question. Maybe first reaction on the live business. It is at least 200 million per year, huh? just to, to make that already sure. In terms of the innovation, uh, innovation uh, pipeline, actually we're doing, as I said before this afternoon, we're doing actually innovation along five dimensions. We incubate ourselves, we acquire or take portions of, uh, of, uh, of interesting startups that diversify our core business. We partner, we develop our own ideas, and actually we invest together with Anthemus in very interesting startups. So that's the whole range, I would say, of, of innovation that is happening on, happening. on the other hand, of course, we also innovate in our core business. That is, that is clear. So it's a combination of two. If we talk about the one billion, however, it's linked to the innovation that we talked about along the five dimensions of incubating, acquiring, and so forth. Um, that's a first rough answer, I think, uh, to your questions. Carsten, from your side, or Matthias, from your side. I, I can take up the live uh, question yeah. if you want. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you for that uh, question. We are not de-emphasizing life. Uh, we are looking at our business portfolio um, from a diversification pr perspective. And what we are doing in the life business is further adapting uh, to, the, uh, to the environment that we are acting in, and that is a journey to be continued uh, that has started um, in uh, 2016. Um, and this journey has, um, has two sides of the coin. One is um, the investment side, and the other side is um, managing our back books. Um, and based on the resilience of the interest rate margin that is resulting from that, um, we expect the life business to contri contribute, as Gerd just said, at, at least 200 million in EBIT, and also 
to continue to be um, a contributor with regard to cash remittance. So the life business continues to play a role in the, the overall uh, portfolio, and we are further adapting and accelerating the journey already traveled. And that includes also um, measures on the product side, as, um, as we have heard from Romain and Michael earlier on, and, uh, and that will uh, lead to a res resilient uh, development in the life business uh, moving forward. And I'm convinced that life uh, business will stay from a portfolio perspective an important contributor both from the earnings as well as from the cash remittance perspective. I can take the question on the shareholders or policyholder funds. Um, uh, those kind of investments are done typically from the shareholders funds because normally in most jurisdictions it's not allowed um, to take this into tight assets of policyholder assets. So it has to be funded from the shareholders funds but also the value creation then is for the shareholder. And maybe just one more thing to add to that. You also have the question is this 100% and so forth, uh, how will this work? It's actually a combination of, of different things that we already see today. Some of the innovations we will indeed own 100%. Most of the cases will be part, partially owner of it. It might also be we're not actually investing in it, but we're partnering. partnering, partnering. So it's a combination of the different forms uh, that, uh, that you can imagine. Thank you very much. Can I can I follow up on that? Sure. That's very helpful on the on the shareholder fund. But is 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 my understanding correct that the one billion value creation is something which eventually will flow through the PL? Carsten, do you want to take it or do I go ahead? Actually, the how we value this one billion uh, innovation uh, pipeline is actually there are different methods of doing it. Of course, there is one method of doing it, which is the easy, easiest one, which is using a multiple. That's one thing. But the other end is, of course, a real transaction. If you do something, a partial sale or partial IPO, for example, that's where you really get the transaction going. And that's, for example, as I said before, in 2018, at the end of 2018, when Seven Ventures as a media partner stepped into Friday, he, he valued, Seven Ventures, of course, valued uh, evaluated uh, Friday at that point in time at over 200 million. So there are different ways of valuing actually this 1 billion um, Swiss francs value. And that's exactly as Carsten said, we will actually start reporting and, fe and feeding back to you on where we stand as from 2022. It's okay. Yeah. Pia. Our next question is from Michael Hotner, Berenberg. Michael, please go ahead. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I loved your day. It's really a lot of fun, and, and thank you. Um, really, a lot of fun. But, um, so the, the questions are really boring, I'm afraid. Um, the first one is: there's no mention of IFRS targets. So I suppose the funny way of asking this is: uh, are you abandoning an IFRS? Is this why there's uh, part of the cost saves? But but I suppose I'm, I'm following on Farouk's question here: is there any way of us to translate into IFRS, or is IFRS something which is really not reflecting value creation. The second is on the uh, IT. So you've given us a target reduction of 20 million. I just wondered how much you actually spend today. That'd be, that'd be really interesting. And the third one, and I'm afraid it's a little bit critical, but I, I probably did my maths wrong. So I see last year you paid for 2019 6.4 in Divi. If I do 500 million, so 2 billion cash, over four years, that's 500 million a year, 80%, that's 400 million, about 50 million shares, that's about eight a share. So over a space of five years, 19 to 25, the dividend would go from 6.4 to 8, which um, here, I'm doing maths on top of my head, so I'm probably wrong, is about 25% in total, or, or maybe four and a bit percent per annum. Um, that doesn't seem a fair measure of your ambition, and I just wondered, if, if I've missed uh, something. And then the last one, and <laughs> I've got so many questions, sorry, but I mean, ignore it. Um, the cash, this two billion, can you, can you, you spoke about life kind of being resilient and earning, so I mean flat maybe, but the cash generation being very strong. Can you split the two billion between the various parts? Thank you. I hope I get the four questions right. I'm happy that I can actually transfer probably three to Carsten. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the first point. Let me, let me take the second question. I, th I think it was about IT and, and how much we invest in the I IT environment. 
Of course, IT is crucial. Huh? In our business, we, see more, we are more and more evolving from a financial services provider to a technical driven financial service provider. So IT is, is really the core, as Alexander has shown in the engine room earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, what is, what is, it is, of course, diff difficult how you define projects and technology projects. What are business projects? What are IT projects? What is the combination? But roughly, I would say roughly, you can say that we spent approximately 150 million a year in IT projects across the group. That's more or less uh, the reference. Um, on the difficult questions, over to Karsten. <laughs> Um, Michael, thank you very much for your, for your questions and thank you for, for being with us this, uh, uh, today. It's much, much appreciated. So starting with IFRS, um, I think we took in, back in 2016, we took a deliberate step away from an only accounting earnings uh, driven perspective by widening exactly to the, um, to the framework that we like to label ECHO, earnings, earnings cash capital and optionality. And as, as Gerd already said before, uh, when we look especially at the innovation part, um, then we, I think it's good to look at it from different perspectives and uh, look at it from different um, methodologies as well. Um, and that is not in the first place by nature um, an IFRS earnings um, target in the, in the beginning. So that is exactly why we're uh, going to start reporting about uh, this part of the new strategy in uh, 2022. Uh, so that was the, uh, the part on, um, on IFRS. Now, while we speak, we are still executing simply safe season one. And when it comes to dividend, um, and as we speak, we expect for 2020 a robust cash generation, um, adding this to the 1.3 billion um, already remitted that uh, Gerd had, has alluded to earlier today already. Um, we are very confident to reach our target for Simply Safe Season 1 by the end of 2021. And then we are starting the new, the new stint um, with uh, the parameters that we have communicated. So I, I couldn't follow all your math, um, but uh, I can reassure you uh, that that is um, what we are doing, focusing on getting the Simply Safe Season 1 target achieved, uh, where I'm very convinced that we will get there. Um, and then starting the new strategic uh, journey. And now, you, uh, unfortunately, you have to remind me of your last question. Can you tell me again what the last aspect was? Well, I, I'll, I'll pick a different one. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, no, no, it was re no, no, really simple one. You know the two billion cash ah, next, yeah. the four years, which, how much life, how much non-life, how much, yeah. I don't know, innovation, if that's a different accounting uh, segment. Uh, I think there, and, and I think that's important, uh, we have not deliberately broken down the 2 billion into sub-targets because we look at it as from a portfolio perspective and it goes without saying that one year, one segment is maybe a little bit stronger than the other one and, uh, and the other way around. But what is important for me from a, from a CFO perspective is that, that we have different sources of, um, of this cash remittance and that we have also diversification across lines of business and across uh, geographies. Um, and I think that makes then um, the cash remittance also resilient and enables us to navigate in uh, different market conditions also when they become a little bit diff difficult at times or uh, benefit from market opportunities for investments if we find investments that we consider to be value creating. Um, and that is um, why we have not broken it down, um, but we keep it on an, on an overall po uh, portfolio perspective. May I ask a follow-up, or I, I can come back later, whatever? No, if you... It's Michael, you really can, simple, very, very quick, very quick. You can go ahead and... Friday. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. Fr Friday, so Friday break-even in 2025, or profit in 2025. W what was the result last year or this year, just to give a base number? And then the, a more broader uh, question, this innovation, my colleague and I were puzzling over it because your business is, is basically insurance and, and other financial services. You've got two things. And, and we just wondered whether it means that innovation will be a third line or third column in the P&L. Maybe first, uh, for the first question, actually, the answer you can also look at at the year end results. I think in the in the in the of 2019 Friday has reported approximately a minus 30 million. That's that's more or less the uh, the, the result. So it needs time indeed to build up the power and the know how 
of such a new digital model. So in the beginning, it's only normal that you focus on growth and that indeed the normal traditional KPIs are not yet following. But that is to, about to come over the next years. Um, what is clearly also so that we have, I would say, in terms of our insurance business, our banking and asset management business, and what is clearly developing into a third leg is the relevant services where we can cross and upsell around the ecosystems in home and mobility. Will we differently report on them in terms of a, an, an, a separate line, a separate P&L line? I would give over to Karsten, but I think what is important, we will value and we will actually report on the value of this third leg of innovation, as Karsten has said, when we start the 2022. I don't think it's the idea to actually break up um, the, uh, the, the P&L that we have adding this third leg, but Karsten, maybe no. something from your side. I think just a word, if I, if I may, on um, um, and referring back to what Sibylle has uh, shared with you uh, uh, earlier on, to, to, on today, um, and you, you recall the, the funnel view that she has shared and, uh, and others, and I think um, that is the important part um, to organize the processes around this. Um, and we are not, uh, not thinking as we speak about an adjustment of segment reporting in IFRS. Let's give the other colleagues also a chance, uh, Michael, if that's okay with you. And, and let's go to the next question, Pia. We have a question from Farqua Murray from Autonomous. Farqua, please go ahead with your question. Hi, all. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just three questions from my side, if possible, please. Uh, firstly, just coming back to the one billion value creation through innovation figure, I just wondered if you could give us a bit of a run through the methodology that you'll use to calculate that. And also, does it create any internal incentives to try and realize that value, for instance, through a transaction in terms of actual conversion to cash? And then secondly, just coming back on the simplification of the product portfolio in life, I just wondered whether you would expect any kind of closed book outcomes to come from that exercise. So obviously, you've done a few bits and pieces here and there. I just wondered if we might see an acceleration on that. And then finally, if we look at the kind of stage one uh, of your strategy exercise, actually a lot of the growth came from more conventional M&A, notably around Belgium, for instance. I just wondered where a conventional M&A would sit within your portfolio, because obviously you've emphasised a lot on innovation, and in a way maybe, maybe that is the focus for the stage two side. Thanks. Let me pick up a, a couple of things, and maybe the colleagues, of course, Matthias and Karsten, can add to that. Uh, in terms of the M&A strategy, the M&A strategy is actually uh, um, the same and the stable one that we have uh, executed over the last couple of years. Meaning, if we have an interesting opportunity in one of our core markets, then we will act actively pursue that. It has, of course, the business case has to be right, the cultural fit has to be there, and we need to have the capabilities to integrate them. So that's the the M&A strategy we have pursued over the last couple of years with evidence in Luxembourg and Belgium for the most, uh, for the most part. Uh, but there is also an alternative M&A strategy, I would say. It's easier to export these new digital models that we are building across, across actually borders than actually to buy brick and mortar and to integrate them. So again, I would say alongside our traditional M&A strategy, we have the new alternative M&A strategy allowing digital models to scale. So that's, that's the first part. On how we will evaluate or evaluate the, uh, the, um, the innovation pipeline, there are different uh, methods of doing so. As, as I said, the extreme one is a real transaction where you actually, you, it's real. The other one is based on multiples and you have intermediate methods uh, in the middle. Um, but Karsten, maybe you want to say something about that. Yeah, in, in adding to, to, um, to what you said, and uh, I think Gert already told us that the playground has different forms also um, in cooperation, in acquiring, in uh, developing, in incubating and so on. So I think it's, it's wise not to take a one-size-fits-all, um, but use these different uh, angles that it has appropriate to the, to the different innovations. Um, and while I speak, if I, if I may, I can take up your, your question on, uh, on life, um, if, I, if I may. Um, and uh, Roma and Michael earlier on um, have talked about the life segment. And um, I think on, on life, we have really two uh, elements that we are looking into. And the one, one is the question on, on what is the new business looking like that we are doing. And the second one is how do, uh, do we manage the existing backbox? 
Um, I already spoke to the existing backbooks before and on the new business, um, focus on capital light products as, um, as Roma has, uh, has shown. Um, focus on risk-based products and biometric products. So the journey that we started back in 2016 is going to continue on the new business. Um, and the backbook business I already commented before. So it, life business really has these two, these two angles uh, to it for the uh, next strategic phase. Okay, well, thanks. Let's move to the next question, Pia. Next question is from Thomas Fossar from HIBC. Thomas, please go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I've got a couple of questions. First one will be on the um, PNC uh, combined ratio to the uh, circa 90%. Um, maybe could you uh, split a bit um, what, you, what you expect to come from cost savings? Uh, the 200 million, obviously, will be uh, across um, different lines of business, but I mean, maybe you could say what you expect uh, on the PNC side and, and by difference, what, what would be a normalized loss ratio you're expecting over the duration of, of, of the plan? The second question would be on the live side. Um, on the risk product, um, I mean, actually the, 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 the risk habit uh, of the life business uh, went up to 14%, but it's still uh, relatively small. I mean, what would be the trend um, over the seven two, and should we expect this to grow more rapidly than that we've seen it during season one? And the third question will be, uh, on, I would say on share buybacks, uh, you, you mentioned that there will be no share buybacks till 2020, 2021. Um, is that due to regulatory pressure or discussion you may have with FINMA? Uh, could, you, could you tell us a bit more on that? Uh, thank you. Well, let me try to tackle question uh, one, two, but of course, and then Carsten number three, but of course, again, colleagues, please add. On the combined ratio, it's actually the target that has been set is clearly 90% throughout Simply Safe season two or in the area of 90%. And actually, we will do that by focusing, as Henk and Jurg has said earlier today, by focusing really on our PNC business, excelling in what we already do ex very, very well today. And it's focused target customer management, it's strong underwriting skills, technical skills, and it's a very disciplined risk and client selection. Election. I think these are the three elements that, uh, that actually contribute to the ambition of the 90% combined ratio. Um, now, I forgot about your live question. Can you repeat it? Sorry? Yeah, the, the question was on the uh, risk, risk, exactly. uh, risk contribution of the EBIT. Yeah. I think there might be a bit of confusion because if we talked about the risk proportion going up to 14%, that's the risk proportion in the new business that we are writing. So we increased from 3% uh, new business in risk products to 14%. So it, I understood it was EBIT, but it has nothing to do with EBIT. The risk result uh, of our live business has been very stable and very solid over, over the last couple of years and contributes much more than 14% to the, to the live result. So we're talking there about new business in risk products. And what is also important, if you look at, at, at guarantees products, Carsten said it, we're moving away, we have moved away from guarantee intensive solutions to capital light services. Actually, if you look at the, the book of business that has guaranteed business that is decreasing all the way because we're generating a lot of capital light new business. And actually, even the guarantees that we have are limited in time or are actually zero. So a 0% guarantee is also a guarantee, but it's a 0% guarantee. Maybe on the share buyback uh, to you, Carsten. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much. So um, I'm very happy to put this, uh, this into perspective. Um, we are currently focusing on innovation. Um, and we have completed um, in April 2020 uh, the last share buyback program with uh, 3 billion shares, and we have completed it um, 100%. So the current focus um, until the end of Simply Safe Season 1, as you, as you rightfully said, is on, on innovation, and we do not intend to buy back shares until then. Yet, um, as we've done in the past share buyback, um, are um, an instrument that is part of our 
proven and demonstrated capital management toolbox um, and will also remain so. Maybe just one more thing to add to that. Carsten talked about the 60 to 80% cash payout in terms of, uh, of, of dividend paying and about the 10 to 30% innovation. Of course, we will only invest and further invest in innovation if it's value generation. So if we will not find good opportunities to invest in innovation in the core or beyond the core, this part, of course, will be available for active capital management going forward as you said earlier this afternoon, Karsten. Our next question would be from René Lojo, main first. René, your questions, please. Yes, thank you very much. So good evening all, and thank you very much for the presentation. So start with a very simple question. And I guess I got the reason now why you have not published an, an ROE target, I guess has to do that you are focusing very much on, on cash and not on IFRS, so just a confirmation then. And then, given that I'm quite a simple guy, in, in PNC, when you target these 200 million cost synergies, I mean, what I thought this morning is 200 million cost savings, 3.3 billion net earned premiums, that will lead to a six percentage point improvement in the combined ratio. But I think this is a little bit too simple and perhaps you can shed a little bit more light here. And next question is on customer satisfaction. Um, interesting to see, I guess, Paul was has a lot of, of happy clients, you know, but um, I just saw a presentation um, from Compare, so that's a platform where you can compare um, Paris here in Switzerland. And it showed that in the period 17 to 20, motor premiums on average decreased by up to 18%. So I'm wondering a little bit, you know, on one side you have to have the clients, and on the other side, I do believe that clients are still very, very price sensitive. Um, and then the last question, I have touched on this already, on, on the new clients, 1.5 million. Could you give us a little bit of feel, you know, what's the potential for, for upselling? So my question would be, policyholder holds how many almost product today? And also cross-selling, so from banking into life, from life into non-life. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Rene. Let me try to start with uh the customer part, the happy customers, and the 1.5 million new net customers that we will win over the period 22-25. Um, it, is, it is true, and we've heard it also uh, this, this afternoon uh, from Hato Schmeisser, that actually happy customers are more loyal and are less price sensitive because they are really being served well. And of course, there's pressure on, on, on the premiums and price will always play a role. But of course, you can overcome this to, some, to a certain extent by really having loyal and satisfied customers. So actually, the basic philosophy again of Simply Safe, also of season two, motivated employees, satisfied, loyal customers, success, that is still valid. On the 1.5 million, and the over 600,000 that we have won in season one up to now, you can actually look at it um, in, in a bit the similar way for season two. Uh, we are winning new clients, net new clients, in every unit. And that being based on both cross and upselling and innovating in our core business, in non-life life banking and asset management, and by initiating the new innovation initiative, initiatives. So it's every unit which is contributing to, uh, to, uh, to the growth. And it's also the core business and the diversify, so go beyond the core business. And the same will happen in the years 22, 25, with every unit continuing to actually win customers in mature markets by innovating in the core. But of course, the proportion of uh, ecosystems, mobility and home clients with cross and upselling will become bigger, as uh, it has been explained by the colleagues earlier this afternoon in the diversify the core part. Um, Carsten, maybe on the, I think, the first two questions of yeah. René? Yeah, I, I think the, um, if I heard you right, René, the first question was, are we prioritizing cash over earnings? 
Um, and uh, yes, our first view on, um, on managing and steering the business comes from a cash perspective, but obviously we have to bear in mind other, other perspectives too, and that's why we have the earnings, capital and optionality um, as, um, as brothers and sisters in the ECHO framework that we are managing towards. Um, but the main uh, perspective starts from a, from a cash perspective, as it has since 2016, um, and we will continue to do so. And can you, I don't have these 200 million. Yeah, the 200 million. What was the question again, Rene? Sorry, I, I forgot about it. So can you repeat it, please? You're muted, Rene. Oh, at least we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm up in the mountains, you know, that's why. So, <laughs> No, no, I, I guess what we can do is um, I'll go back to, to the IR department tomorrow. You know, it's, it's more a number crunching number. It's very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rene. Next question, and I hope there's one question for Matthias. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's hear what the question is, Pia. As we are now almost at the end of our Q&A, I would suggest that we jump to the questions that came in to the chat. So we go with the first one. What are the main drivers, the secret ingredients to improve employee satisfaction from your point of view? Well, there is no one single silver bullet. Huh? It's, it's clear that there is no one solution, one, one ingredient or one uh, magical formula that, uh, that actually uh, uh, that, that, that increases the motivation and the commitment and the engagement of our people. It's a multitude of things, often very small things. Um, we have been talking about, and, and Burchu and Janneke earlier this afternoon have given a number of examples. It's about small things, it's about team spirit, it's about role modeling from the top, but also the Sparks community, that actually changing the culture, the culture as we speak from horizontal and bottom-wise point of view. So it's a, a, whole, a, whole new, uh, a whole set, I would say, of initiatives. And the good thing to see is that we, we already had a very strong culture. We have continued to change the strong culture over the last couple of years, and it's becoming a sort of flywheel. So it's actually, it's, it's fueling itself now. So there's not a lot we need to do anymore. It's actually spreading as a viral change, as a, as a social movement throughout, uh, throughout our company with people standing up, teaming up, taking initiatives, taking responsibility. And that is actually what is uh, happening almost automatically. So no one single thing, it's a broad, uh, a broad thing of initiatives, and they are very often, or almost all the time, I would say today, initiated by our own people, not by management. We have a next question on the ESG rating. <sighs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you relying on a third-party ESG rating? I have made the experience that the MSCI ESG analysis is incomplete and flawed. You should make your own judgment. That's really a question for you, Matthias. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, indeed, as I indicated earlier this afternoon, we're using MSCI as uh, one of our three pillars uh, for uh, the responsible investment policy. And the reason why we chose MSCI was that this gave us uh, a quick possibility to assess the ESG of a broad set of companies, basically the entire market. So it was a first step, uh, but of course we, uh, do not solely rely on, on the ESG rating by MSCI. We have our own judgment, and the, in the end, it's always a judgment call, what you do in a specific situation. And going forward, we'll, we'll further develop our ESG rating and our ESG strategy. We have time for one more question. Tesla has announced to enter the insurance market. How does Balwas deal with such statements? We are not worried by competition. Also, if competition comes from uh, not the normal, I would say, usual suspects. In, in this afternoon, I think we have shown that uh, actually by focusing even better on our core business, by reimagining our core business, becoming really easy to work with, and by diversifying our business, we're also moving into the mobility ecosystem, so the Tesla ecosystem. So actually, we're uh, not afraid of that uh, competition. We have plenty of other questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to answer them now. 
But we would like to ask every one of you who has um, asked the question in the chat that you please reach out to our investor relations team so they can follow up with you separately at a later point. And with that, I would like to hand back to you, Gerald, for the closing. Thank you, Pia. And I would like now to close our Investors' Day just by repeating the key messages of, of this afternoon. One, we have a very excellent track record with Simply Save up to now. We have kept our promises and we will keep our promises by the end of 2021. But of course, the world is rapidly changing and we want to play a key role in this changing world. And therefore, we need to change, adapt and transform ourselves even faster. But our strong culture and our very committed almost 8,000 people are key in becoming truly relevant. And we will focus our core business, reimagine it, diversify it, and transform ourselves to become a tech-driven, customer-centric financial service provider and a key player in the ecosystems of home and mobility. We'll really be standing out and we will become essential to people's life. That again, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of Simply Safe Season 2. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the Balois Investor Day 2020. You will find all relevant documents about today's event online on investorday.balois.com. Thank you for watching and have a great day.